from New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power. This is where the world of politics meets the world of business. We're going to start as we try to do every day with a check on the markets. And for that, we go to Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, as I look at this, equity markets are kind of bullish. They're on their way up. I assume that's partly vaccine. Is any of it stimulus? Uh, you know, I think it's mainly vaccine at this point, David. Just the sense of optimism that 2021, we're going to see some sort of return to normal, and particularly the economy and the second half of 2021, of course, the stock market tends to forecast out six months. So that is the optimistic side. The S&P 500 not up as much as the Nasdaq, up about four tenths of 1%, and, and frankly, off of its highs. The Nasdaq, on the other hand, up 1.3%. And what makes this interesting, David, is the Nasdaq, of course, technology, big internet, this is this year's defense. So we see this year's defense outperforming on the day as the Dow Jones transportation average uh, underperforms down eight tenths of 1%. We also have crude oil down. One reason to have a little bit of concern around uh, those two areas being lower, they are certainly uh, more sensitive, I would say, uh, to the virus. So we have a little bit of a divergence on the day uh, that is in beneath the surface, again, points to some uncertainty, uh, making it very, very interesting, of course. Never a dull day, David. But yes, the main theme, optimism around the vaccine. Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report of the markets. Well, hope does spring of eternal, first about the vaccine, but also maybe some hope about that stimulus bill. We keep hearing about it. We never quite seem to get there. To give us a report on where we are up on Capitol Hill, whether we're going to get there, we welcome now Michael Zizas. He is Morgan Stanley, head of U.S. Public Policy Research. So thank you so much for being us with us, Michael. Give us your take right now where this stands. I know that the bipartisan group is supposed to actually introduce some legislation today. Hey, David. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're watching for that. But I, I think at the moment, the most we can say is that it appears like the reaction function that should lead to stimulus is kicked in, which is to say that when you have divided government, you'd expect that it takes some weaker conditions around the issue at hand. In this case, it would be COVID. We've obviously seen COVID caseloads go up. We've seen some weaker economic data with a miss on the non-farm payroll number. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that you finally got Republicans and Democrats to effectively close their one and a half trillion dollar um, difference on what the total number of money should be spent here. And now it seems like they're just sorting out the details on what a nine hundred billion dollar to a trillion dollar stimulus should look like. Those details um, are, are, are pretty important. And it's not clear to me that even with some of this news we might get later today that they'll be ironed out. Uh, but it syncs up with the notion that uh, at least before, um, or, or that what our economists have on paper, which is that at least before the end of the first quarter, you're going to get something like a trillion dollars worth of COVID-related relief here. So there are a lot of people, as you know, Michael, who are really hurting in the meantime. I mean, the end of the first quarter might not sound that far ahead for us, but it is for a lot of people who are worried about putting food on the table. Uh, to what extent will the Georgia runoff affect whether we get it now or later or how big it is? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a critical point, obviously, that the timing is, is incredibly important here to, uh, to, to people in need. Um, and the Georgia runoff is another important node here because to us, the outcome represents the difference between being on the trajectory towards something like a $1 trillion bill uh, versus being on the trajectory towards something more like $2 trillion. The Democrats obviously have the, the motive to spend quite a bit more on COVID relief as memorialized in the HEROES Act from, uh, from back in the spring. If they were to take control uh, of the Senate by winning both of those seats in the Georgia runoff, I think it's fair to say that even if you got only a trillion dollars of stimulus passed in the lame duck session here, uh, the Democrats would probably top that off um, when, uh, you know, in, in January, February, sometime in the first quarter. And if you didn't get that action in the lame duck session, well, you could see something like a $2 trillion bill pass in its entirety in the first quarter of next year. We've talked about it before, but it bears repeating. The two big issues appear to be assistance to state and local government on the one hand and the other, limitations on liability. Do you have a sense of why this is so terribly important? We just had Jason Furman on Bloomberg Television last hour, and he was saying if he, it was up to him, he'd do it without those two things. Yeah, well, so the state and local money issue is, is kind of driven by a few things, but I think the economist's general concern is that state and local revenue is falling well short of forecast through the end of calendar year 2021. 
And unless you backfill that money, state and local governments will do what they typically do in an economic cycle, which is they'll undertake austerity while the rest of the economy is trying to get started and so that that can be a drag. Um, you know, the liability issue, I think that's a little, that's, that's more nuanced in terms of how much protection uh, Republicans want to give companies versus Democrats. But um, it, it, this is, uh, both these issues have obviously become quite a bit politicized. Uh, it's not clear how both sides can kind of navigate through these issues to get to a compromise. Part of the reason that this continues to be a tricky negotiation, even though um, both sides have kind of come down to the same top line number. So, Michael, the short-term issue, and it is a very important one, is the assistance to so many people that need it. But longer term, how are the markets likely to react if, in fact, the Democrats do sort of draw to an inside straight and get both of those seats from Georgia? They get a majority in the Senate. It could affect a lot of President-elect Biden's campaign and his agenda. How would the markets react to that? Are they already pricing that in? Yeah. Well, no, not necessarily. So, in our view... I think the Treasury market is probably the place to look uh, for sensitivity to the the Georgia runoffs, and that's because the Democrats taking those two seats obviously explained why we thought it could add an extra trillion dollars of stimulus. It also would enable uh, many of the policy choices in the Biden agenda, um, an expansion of health care spending, potentially an expansion of infrastructure spending, things that we don't think are likely if the Republicans keep the Senate. Um, those are relatively big ticket spending items, and we don't think that they would be able to increase taxes to sufficiently offset the spending. So you could be looking at a much more substantial fiscal expansion um, if the Democrats take those two seats. That would probably uh, lead, or we think that would probably lead to Treasury yields rising beyond what um, our team has forecasted for uh, the balance of 2021. Okay, Michael, really always a treat to have you with us, Michael Zizis of Morgan Stanley. Coming up, we're going to talk about those Georgia runoffs, which are on deck without question. And in fact, we're going to be talking about what's being done to open up areas for, for voting, the way the Atlanta Hawks did last time with their stadium. We're going to talk to Tony Ressler. He's the lead owner of the Atlanta Hawks, as well as the founder, co-founder, and chairman of Aries Management. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We go now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. Americans have started being vaccinated for the coronavirus. In New York, the first person to get the shot outside of a trial was an intensive care nurse. Over the next three days, the shots will arrive at more than 600 hospitals across the United States. The 2.9 million doses will be given to health care workers and nursing home residents. London is tightening its COVID-19 restrictions to the toughest in the country. Health officials say the capital will be put into Tier 3 due to soaring infections and hospitalizations. That means the closures of pubs, bars, restaurants and indoor entertainment venues. The move comes just days before the UK plans to relax the rules over household gatherings for five days over the Christmas holiday. New York City should be prepared for a full shutdown and start making plans to work remotely. That from Mayor Bill de Blasio. He says he agrees with Governor Andrew Cuomo, who told the New York Times that the city could be looking at a shutdown within a month. Despite rising cases and hospitalizations, Mayor de Blasio says schools remain safe and more will be reopening for in-person learning. On Capitol Hill, a group of Republicans and Democrats are set to unveil a two-part coronavirus relief package. One part will include just liability protections and aid for state and local governments. The other will include all the provisions that have broad support, including aid for small businesses. The bill's backers are hoping that some sort of stimulus can be included in a government spending bill needed by Friday. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Well, early voting gets underway today in Georgia in those runoff Senate elections. And once again, the Atlanta Hawks are opening their arena for voting. 
And we welcome now the lead owner of the Atlanta Hawks, Tony Resser, who also happens to be the co-founder and, and chairman of uh, Aries Management. So, Tony, great to have you with us. Last time you were with us, it was in the lead up to the November 3 election. You were opening your arena. Give us a sense of how that worked and what you learned from that experience that you're applying this time. Well, uh, good to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Um, Listen, I think what we learned is that it's absolutely possible to have folks come to vote and be in and out of a safe and efficient voting environment in less than 20 minutes and do it safely and properly. And this is, uh, as we tried to describe earlier and as we uh, certainly have reaffirmed through action, uh, a public-private partnership where an arena can step up, partner with the local authorities, and actually provide a safe and attractive voting location, uh, I think Atlanta should be extremely proud of itself and is now a model of voting in this country rather than, shall we say, a while ago where people didn't look at it quite that way. Tony, do you have any sense at this point whether it's affecting turnout? Because it struck me as I understand it, you don't have to go, you don't have to be in a particular precinct to be able to go to the Hawks Arena to in order to vote. You, if you're from Georgia, from the entire area, you could vote. Are you getting a bigger turnout, you think, because it's just easier to do it? Well, I think at our arena, I think they call it a super polling location. Anywhere in Fulton County, you could, and if you are from anywhere in Fulton County, you could come vote at the arena. And I might add, uh, in this go round, our friends at the Atlanta Falcons, uh, after the first week, are going to take on the next two weeks of opening Mercedes-Benz Stadium. So let's just say the fairway is widening uh, to those members of the private sector in Atlanta that are really helping making voting more accessible, easier, more efficient, et cetera. So uh, the, the answer to your question of whether it's increasing turnout, uh, I don't really know. We, I, I think people think that it is easier to vote, more folks are coming to vote. Uh, obviously, there's a whole lot of politics out there, but uh, our, our objective was really to make voting easier. And whether you're Republican or Democrat, we wanted to make voting easier in Atlanta, in the state of Georgia. I, I think we kind of helped to do that, and we're proud of it. Uh, the, the turnout on November 3rd was extraordinary, the highest, as I understand it, since 1900 in this country as a proportion. Uh, are people getting tired of Georgia of elections? Do you have any sense that people are not as likely to turn out this time to vote for whichever candidate? Listen, uh, I, I don't think I'd be the first to say that uh, most of America has uh, both COVID fatigue and voting fatigue and politics <laughs> fatigue. Uh, let, let's admit that. But uh, listen, runoffs don't generally receive as much attention in Georgia or anywhere else. But I think this runoff is so uh, uh, important nationally as I think, uh, as a statement of the obvious, uh, I think there is gonna be pretty impressive turnout. Uh, there were long lines uh, before we opened the doors this morning. So uh, I do expect there to be a meaningful turnout. And I think people do know uh, that actually uh, control of the Senate seems to be at stake. Uh, so, Tony, let's put this in a broader context of the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, and and yeah, Atlanta Hawks is a citizen of the community in Atlanta because you're doing this voting thing. It's not the only thing that you're doing down there at all. So I understand you just had a refinancing of your facility, and you specifically went to a syndicate of black bank banks. Tell us about that. Well, l listen, at the Atlanta Hawks, like every NBA franchise, <laughs> we're, we're trying to win games. We're trying to run a good business. And, and, and our view, at least, is we do think we could be a positive force in the community. Uh, we thought opening our arena to voting was just one uh, action we could take that would help uh, be a good community asset, if you will. Um, listen, we've tried to help uh, public education in K-12 schools throughout Metro Atlanta. We've built uh, park and rec centers uh, around Metro Atlanta. We are certainly actively involved in helping Black economic empowerment, uh, refinancing our bank facility. Uh, with a consortia of black banks it was actually good business. Uh, we thought good business dealing with good people. Uh, we do think it highlights the importance, the importance of having successful black banks, black owned banks and black run banks in this country. We do think access to capital is a critical component of improving economic empowerment for the African-American community. So uh, yes, it, it's part of what we call good business uh, dealing with good people. So we're proud of it, and uh, actually, we got a very attractive refinancing done, and we couldn't be more proud. A, a lot of us are watching Capitol Hill right now and the need for fiscal stimulus, the back and forth over that, even as there are people across the country, and I'm sure in Atlanta, 
who are really hurting, really hurting. And as you know so well, Tony, the black communities across the country have been disproportionately hit by COVID. Give us a sense in Atlanta of what is particularly needed right now. I think Atlanta is a microcosm of the country. It's a, it's actually a booming economic area that has massive uh, inequality. Uh, I would say that Atlanta, like many uh, really uh, strong economic areas in America, but have had uh, really uh, a tough going with certain types of businesses from COVID. Of course, uh, hospitality related hotels, restaurants, uh, arenas, uh, stadiums, businesses that require people to come to them. Uh, there's a whole lot of folks in this country uh, with real economic strain, as we know. And uh, I can't quite, uh, you know, you had several people on uh, speaking about uh, the stimulus requirements. It doesn't seem as complicated to me as it does to many. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we probably have 160 million jobs in this country, and 40 million of those have been really exposed to COVID. That's 40 million families under duress. Uh, those families have to get uh, stimulus checks, and I would argue those checks uh, should be going uh, this week, and it doesn't seem as complicated to me. Uh, you know, if you take $3,000 checks for 40 million families on a monthly basis, we, we see light. We need six months of $120 billion a month. That's a $700, $750 billion stimulus package day one there's a whole lot of other steps that should come after or in conjunction, but that that doesn't seem controversial. It seems a statement of the obvious, and I, I just can't figure out why that's not moving forward, irrespective of politics. And finally, Tony, let's turn back to basketball and the NBA. You're going to start the season up next week, as I understand. It's going to be very different from that bubble down in Orlando at the Disney facility. What are your concerns? What have you learned from the experience last time, or that matter from what the NFL is going through right now? Uh, I, I don't know if I'd call them concerns. I, I would rather say acknowledgements, which is it's really complicated to run uh, the NBA right now in this time of COVID, just like it is the NFL, just like it was the Major League Baseball, just like it was in National Hockey League. Uh, so running professional sports uh, is so important in today's world. I truly believe the ability to watch uh, and enjoy professional sports for folks that really are uh, forced to be shut in, I think is an extremely valuable thing for us to have as Americans. On the other hand, uh, listen, we want to keep all of our players and all of our staff and all of our employees safe. So we're trying to be incredibly cautious. Uh, many of the folks that have read through the NBA rules and regulations uh, might say that uh, many of the rules are exhaustive to 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 uh, to really follow and uh, I would be one of those but but I also understand how complicated it is to make everyone feel that we're doing everything possible to put on high quality basketball in a safe environment it's just difficult to do and I I actually congratulate even though this is the party line I congratulate Adam Silver and the entire staff of the NBA league office making all 30 teams abide by really exhaustive rules and regulations so the players and all of our employees feel that we're doing the best possible. Yeah, I, I, I doubt that anybody thinks that Adam Silver for the NBA or Roger Goodell for the NFL isn't doing their very, very best, and they do have, as you say, exhaustive rules and requirements. We had Daryl Green, you know, the, the all-star cornerback for the Washington Redskins on last week, and he said the only problem with that in the NFL is this, you actually have people involved. It's also awful hard to get your players to all comply with that, particularly when they're outside the arena. Is that a concern for you? Of course. I it, can't believe I'm supporting Daryl Green. You know, as an old time, I grew up as a Giants fan. What a cornerback. <laughs> but away from that, uh, I'm just going to say that uh, it's, it's, of course, you know, players, employees are going home. We don't have the ability to create a bubble as we did in Orlando. So, of course, the level of risk is different. But listen, we're doing everything we can. We're having daily testing. We're having remarkable amounts of caution in the arena relative to who could come within 30 feet of players. We're uh, separating uh, players from uh, certainly from fans and employees. We're doing everything imaginable, but exactly as you're suggesting, this is not going to be 100% successful. We know that, but we are doing everything imaginable, and we are acknowledging that, like most Americans, you have to go to work, you have to do your best, and you have to be smart. And I think that's what we're trying to do in the NBA. 
Yeah, really well said. And I must say, for all us sports fans out here, we're all rooting for it to work. Thank you so much, Tony. It's always great to have you with us. Tony Ressler He is the lead owner for the Atlanta Hawks, as well as being the co-founder and chairman of Aries Management. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I know, I know, I know. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I am David Weston. Well, there was a big cyber hack over the weekend, and one of the companies involved is very much our stock of the hour in the crosshairs today. And for the full report, we turn now to Emma Chandra. Thanks very much, David. We are, of course, talking about solar winds down more than 16% at the lows today. That's the most ever for this company, which went public back in 2018 and had been on a pretty good ride since then. Why the plummet today? Well, it's all down to what's being described as a highly sophisticated cyber attack, one that was likely instigated by a nation state, with some reports saying that nation state is Russia, Russia denying this. Now, what we understand from this cyber attack is that the attackers use the company's own software updates for its Orion software to send malware to customers. SolarWinds today saying about 18,000 customers affected. They have about 33,000 customers in total and that they've been issued essentially a patch to deal with it and that more will come tomorrow. But of course, what is interesting or what matters most in a story like this is who those customers are. And David, they are a who's who of federal uh, agencies and top business. On the government side, we're talking about the Treasury Department, the Commerce Department, the State Department, all five arms of the U.S. military, as well as the FBI. Now, as I said, the company says it's alerted those affected. It's also issuing patches and more will come tomorrow. But of course, what we're hearing from the government side is all those federal agencies that have been impacted have been told to essentially disconnect from SolarWinds' software. David. Yeah, it's fascinating, Emma. I wonder how much damage really was done by hacking. We don't really know what information they got, right? We don't know exactly what information they had at the moment, and I'm sure we will get more information on that over the next uh, few days and weeks, David. Thank you so much, Tamachandra. Up next, vaccines are on the way, but they're not here yet. We're going to talk with Sanal Shah of Georgetown University about what we do in the meantime. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We're going now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you very much. Members of the Electoral College are meeting today to officially elect Joe Biden. Georgia has just awarded him 16 votes. Some Republican lawmakers have said that would be the end of President Trump's attempts to overturn the results as far as they're concerned. Electors are committed to voting for the winner of the popular vote in each state. The president has said he'll continue with legal challenges. A proposed federal spending bill to which a COVID-19 relief package could be added is targeted for release on Capitol Hill as soon as tomorrow. Today, a bipartisan group of lawmakers will unveil a two-part proposal with $908 billion in assistance for the pandemic-ravaged economy. The spending bill needs to be passed before federal funding runs out December 18th. The Prime Minister of Israel will enter quarantine until Friday after meeting with a confirmed COVID-19 patient. Benjamin Netanyahu's office says he was tested Sunday and today, and both times the results were negative. It's the third time Prime Minister Netanyahu has been forced into quarantine since the start of the pandemic. Netanyahu has said he would like to become the first Israeli to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. The weekend spring-like temperatures are giving way to winter conditions across the northeast. The New York metro area could get up to a foot of snow beginning late Wednesday. The impending storm has prompted winter storm watches and advisories to pop up from Kentucky to New Jersey. The winter blast comes after temperatures soared on Sunday to 62 degrees in Central Park and 66 in Washington. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. 
Thank you so much, Mark. Well, the first vaccine inoculations are happening today in the United States, giving us all hope that at some point this pandemic will be over, but it's not over yet. So that raises the question, what do we do in the meantime? To give us some answers, we welcome now Georgetown University Professor Sanal Shah, who is also founding executive director of the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation. So, Professor, thank you so much for being with us. Give us a sense, apart from getting inoculated when we can, what do we need to do in the meantime? David, thank you for having me, and it's great to be here. I think the vaccine is such an important part of where we are in the pandemic, but alone, it's not enough. As you know, the number of vaccines that have been sent out are not nearly enough for the size of the population and for everybody. So what's important for us is that we also have a testing regime that allows us to test the number of people. So for example, if you're opening up schools or colleges, you can be able to test uh, your students, your teachers, your professors, your faculty, your staff, and have that test going on on a regular basis. There are fast, rapid tests that have already been developed and approved. You can use, we can use those tests because the vaccine, it's not going to be ready until May for, for the rest of the population. Just in Texas, for example, where I am, um, we're not going to inoculate 28 million people and we haven't even gotten enough vaccines uh, for 1 million. So, so, Professor, it may be different down in Texas than it is in New York, but I've got to tell you, in New York, it's not that easy sometimes to get a test, whether a rapid test or otherwise. We see long lines at some facilities, and some people say, well, we just don't have the rapid test. Have we done what we need to do in this country to make sure everybody has ready access to the testing that they need? Yeah, David, great question. And, and, and so there's three types of tests. There's the, there's the test that we have, which is the uh, PCR test that you have to go in and get the, uh, get the, you know, where they put a sw swab up your nose. There are also rapid tests that are, are available on the market. The question is, we haven't actually used those rapid tests as, as a way to screen and to make sure we can do it quickly. And these tests are 15 minute tests. Uh, for example, Abbott has a test uh, that takes 15 minutes. You take it, you can take it at home um, and you can screen and you can also show it on your app that you have taken the test and that you've the result can show up on an app for you. So there are these rapid tests. The cities and states have to make a decision to use these rapid tests, and, and many of them haven't yet made them. So there are some cities and states that are trying to do it, but most of them haven't really used these rapid tests as a way. So businesses are using them. For example, if you are taking a United Airlines flight from San Francisco to Hawaii, you will get one of these rapid tests, and they will let you know immediately within 15 minutes whether that test shows if you are positive or negative. So while these tests don't aren't exact proofs of whether you have it or not, just like every other test, it does give you an, a, a screening about ability to make sure that people have taken the test before they get on a flight or come into an office building or come into a school. Professor, when you say that some states and some local governments have not decided to use these tests that are available, is that because of cost, it's too expensive, or is there some other issue there? What is causing some people to use it and some people not? Um, I think it's it's dependent. It's uh, For some, it's cost. For some, it's how do we distribute? Which population do we give it to? Where do we test it? How do we do it? So I don't think it's always a cost issue. I think partially it's cost, but I think it's also partially the ability to say, hey, how can we use these quickly? Because we've sort of left to each state, each county, each city trying to figure this out for themselves. But some guidance that would say any state can use these rapid tests and make that happen. I think these are some decisions that states have to make. If, if it were all up to you, if you had all the resources in the world, how many people would get tested how often? Is there is there a, a benchmark that we should be striving for? Well, I think that, and I'm, I'm, uh, I may be a little bit off on my numbers, David. Uh, I think that the rapid test can, uh, you know, depends on the protocol that we're using with the CDC and what the latest data is showing us. But I think every five to seven days we can take these tests. And imagine if I went into work every week and I had taken a test on a Monday, it would last me through Friday. But if we wanted to, you could take it three times, or twice a week. And I could take it on a Monday. I could take it on a Wednesday just to make sure that I didn't catch anything in between. But there is a way. It's really up to the each organization to do that. So Amazon, Walmart, others are already using some of these tests to rapidly test their employees on a regular basis and make sure that um, they're getting tested and that they, they when they come into their warehouses or when they come into their workplaces, they have been tested and have been screened. Now, the rest of the protocols still have to be set. So once you know someone has tested positive, 
what happens? How do we notify everybody around you to let them know that you were tested positive? So you're maybe being tested a little bit more often. So some of these have to still be worked through, but we can do this and there is a way to do this. And frankly, in East Asia, uh, Korea has been doing this for the last six months and that's actually been very successful for them. Well, and that leads to the question, how much of this is the government? We have a Biden administration. It's going to take office now, January 20. President, Vice President, President-elect Biden has said that his number one priority is dealing with the coronavirus. How much can this new administration do to achieve the level of testing we need until we get the vaccine widely disseminated? So I think we can do it in two ways. One, we have to, and we've already seen the Biden administration put out information saying that they want to get rapid tests quickly approved by EUA. They want to make sure that they're giving guidance to every state, every county official, that they can use tests and they can, testing is one piece of the strategy. It's not enough by itself, but testing is one piece of the strategy, especially the rapid tests. Um, and making sure in the meantime, before the vaccine gets out, that we can keep our economy open. We are in the economy segment here and can keeping the economy as open is super important to much of the population because they can't afford not to be working right now. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Really great to have you with us. That's Professor Sanal Shah of Georgetown University. Coming up, we're going to talk about that vaccine, not the testing, but the vaccine itself, with the lead investigator of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. He is Dr. Mark Mulligan of NYU Langone Medical Center. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, New York appears to be shutting down. Last week, Governor Andrew Cuomo said that New York City could no longer have in-place in, in, in dining. They had to dine outside. Now today, the mayor, Mr. de Blasio, says he may well be shutting down the city. For a report, welcome now Michael McKee. He is our international economics and policy correspondent. So, Mike, what's going on? Well, Governor Cuomo said last week that the rate of increase in infections in New York City might lead him to shut the city down, go back to the kind of closures that we saw in the spring. And the mayor, de Blasio, today said that that might be uh, something that actually does happen and people should start to prepare. David, you're already working from home. Mr. de Blasio said everybody should consider working from home now if they can. Uh, as you mentioned, restaurants are shut down except for outdoor dining and takeaway. And it doesn't look like outdoor dining is going to be a big part of anybody's nights uh, the next couple of nights as we prepare for a blizzard here in New York City. So the city getting ready to maybe face what it faced in the spring again. Yeah, those poor restaurant owners, they're really having a tough time, as so many people are. Thank you so much to our colleague, Mike McKee. Well, FDA approval late Friday of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine means that now it's being distributed, and some people actually are being inoculated even today. We welcome now somebody who was the lead investigator of that vaccine. He is Dr. Yeah. Mark Mulligan of NYU Langone Medical Center. He's also the director of the Infectious Diseases and Immunology Division of the Langone Medical Center. So thank you so much for being with us, doctor. Uh, give us a sense, uh, you know this vaccine well, of the distribution side of right now. How fast can we really get it out as a practical matter to uh, how many Americans? Yeah, in terms of the safety and efficacy, the science, you know, we've really uh, been amazing over the last six, seven months. To now we have the vaccine with an emergency approval. So the logistics are the tricky. There's a very limited supply and CDC has recommended healthcare providers and long-term care facility residents, nursing homes initially. So I think people should recognize that it's an incredible scientific medical achievement, but that it won't be like flipping a switch. It'll be rolling. Dr. Mulligan, I'm sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. We're going to get that fixed so we can talk to Dr. Mark Mulligan about the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, uh, vaccine. So, Michael uh, McKeeve is back with us now. Thank you for staying with us, Mike. Uh, we are looking at the possible shutdown of New York City. Is there any suggestion it could go beyond New York City, for example, to Westchester County? Because Westchester County is being hit pretty hard as well. Yes, the governor has said that he will take action uh, whenever he needs to. When infection rates get above certain targets, New York City 
uh, was looking to hit a 5% positivity rate in testing, and it's at 5.5 now. So it, they are saying that the virus is replicating very, very rapidly. We saw the same kind of action in London today where they were going to make a decision in London on whether to move to Tier 3 restrictions on Wednesday, but instead made the decision today because they said the virus was almost doubling in its caseload in uh, London over the last couple of days. So Governor Cuomo has imposed some individual sanctions on individual places within the state, but it looks like they're preparing for the possibility that they have to start shutting down various parts of the state. Ironically, uh, we see a lot of cases in Suffolk and Nassau counties, Long Island, and that's where the first shot in the United States of the Pfizer vaccine went today to a nurse in Long Island. Yeah, so, Mike, you raise a very interesting point. Uh, do we know what metrics they're looking at? Because for a long time, it was all about positivity, the percentage of people taking the test who actually tested positive. But there's some increased concern, isn't there, about uh, hospital beds and hospital capacity? There is concern about hospital capacity, particularly in New York City. However, the state has so many ICU beds that Governor Cuomo's put in place a plan to transfer people from uh, places where there is a shortage to places where there is excess. And right now, that's still uh, a very live possibility. So uh, New York doesn't have the same kind of problem, say, that New Mexico has, which it had 102 percent use of its ICU beds last week, or even California that's getting very close to 100 uh, percent. But it is still an issue, and it is one of the metrics they are following. Okay, Mike, thank you so very much for staying with us and helping us out there, because now we have Dr. Mark Mulligan back on the telephone, as it were. So, Dr. Mulligan, I'm sorry about those technical problems. I, I wanted to pick up on something you talked about, which is the efficacy and the safety of this vaccine, because you were lead investigator on the vaccine. And there are a lot of questions people have. Let me start with one of them, and that's allergies. There are some reports that people with at least some forms of allergy, particularly people who might not use an EpiPen, might not be good candidates to take this vaccine. Is that right? So what we... What we know is that uh, all vaccines do have a very rare incidence of severe allergy anaphylaxis. It's a well-known but rare one in a million CDC estimates with all vaccines. So it's not surprising that, that this will happen as this vaccine rolls out in some people. What um, is being said right now by uh, 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 FDA is that, um, they, that this should be an area of caution that those that have a known history of allergy to vaccines or, or the vaccine component should not receive the vaccine. Most people won't fall in that group. So others that have severe allergy anaphylaxis, it should be a discussion with their provider. They decide to proceed that, the, you know, that let's say they're at very high risk for COVID-19 uh, and they feel they should get the vaccine. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a balance of, of uh, uh, the benefit and the potential risk. That's fine. They can proceed. But they should do it in a location that's able to handle um, a severe allergic reaction and anaphylaxis. Another question that's come up is uh, pregnant women and women who are uh, breastfeeding. Uh, is there a risk for them and for their children? So this has not been studied in detail. However, again, uh, kind of a similar answer. What, uh, what we believe CDC will be saying, and they, can, they are about to come out with their recommendations uh, as well as ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, is that uh, this is something that can be done. Uh, it hasn't been studied, but the preponderance of evidence is that this is a very safe vaccine, and, and especially for pregnant women that have significant risk. And right now, remember, we're talking about uh, health care providers. There are about 400,000 estimated health care providers who are pregnant or breastfeeding women. For those women who may have significant occupational risk, the uh, potential benefit would likely outweigh uh, uh, a lower risk of harm. Again, it's going to be studied in detail. We don't yet have the evidence, and so it calls for clinical judgment and, again, discussion with your provider. But it is something that pregnant women can be empowered to do. It's not prohibited in any way. So it's a nice thing that you know, women can make this decision for their, their bodies and for their fetus. Another thing people are asking a lot of questions about is durability. If you get the vaccine and it does actually make you immune to the disease, for how long? Did the study that you were the lead investigator, did it give us any indication of the durability? Well, we're, we're learning this uh, as we go now. Uh, we've, we've only vaccinated uh, starting on May 4th with the first individual, so we have about seven months of follow-up. In the, in the phase three trial, uh, the average length of follow-up was about two months, and, and we know there's 95% protection within that window. 
every expectation would be that for several more months, there'll be a very high level. There's going to be some slow decline in, in the immune response, but one of the beautiful things about vaccination is that it induces memory. So this is all to be determined, but my guess would be that we may well see uh, a very uh, considerable level of protection uh, as far out as between six and 12 months. It's possible after that we'd need to have uh, booster vaccination, but maybe not. Um, we just have to let a little more time pass. The studies will continue and will continue to study this. Okay, Dr. Mark Mulligan of the NYU Langone Medical Center. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm delighted to say Dr. Mulligan will be staying with us for the second hour of Balance of Power over on Bloomberg Radio because there are a fair number of questions we have yet to ask. In the meantime, we want to turn to Georgia and those two critical runoff elections in the Senate. We welcome now a professor of political science from Emory, and she is Andra Gillespie. So, Professor, thank you so much for being with us. Give us your sense on where these two races stand right now, as far as we can tell. Um, well, right now, um, uh, the survey data that has been publicly released suggests that these races are uh, within the statistical margin of error, so they're too close to call. And I think that that would be expected, especially given the presidential election results. So I don't know, you know, who's going to win, but I expect that the race is going to be close and that this is really going to come down to turnout. Um, you know, Democrats have proven that they can get uh, more of their voters out to the polls in a statewide election. They're going to try to do that again. We'll see whether or not it works. And if either side falters in their get-out-the-vote efforts, it's probably going to be to their detriment. Let me ask you this question, and I'll confess it may be a little bit of a selfish question. How long do you think it's going to take before we know? I mean, Georgia was a real nail-biter on November 3rd, and there were recounts and things like that. Do we have any indication? Is it because there are only two races, it won't be as hard? Uh, well, I mean, you know, the volume is going to be smaller, so even though I expect very high turnout for a runoff election, I, you know, don't expect that we're going to have 5 million votes cast the way we did in, in the presidential election. So I still think that there may be some lag, um, you know, uh, depending on the number of absentee ballots that come in. Um, and uh, my sense is, based on reports, is that there are uh, many people have requested absentee ballots. Uh, so it should be shorter, but, you know, we may have to wait until, you know, the next day, Wednesday um, or Thursday, to get a bigger sense of, of what the final count is once all the absentee ballots have been counted. Uh, President Trump is not on the ballot this time, was on the ballot last time, and he tends to generate voter turnout, I think it's fair to say, perhaps on both sides, both for him and against him. Do we have a sense whether that will really uh, deter some people from coming out, or at least they won't have the same motivation to? Um, well, uh, you know, I think the general rule of thumb is that you get your highest turnout in presidential elections. It doesn't matter who the president is. And so for that reason, we assume that turnout is going to be lower um, in, in, in this election. Um, really, this is about mobilization and get out the vote. So, yes, President Trump certainly activated a group of latent Republican voters who don't have a history of turning out in runoff elections. And so Republicans are going to reach out to those voters to try to remind them to get them to turn out to vote and to raise their likelihood of, of turning out to vote. Similarly, the Democratic coalition includes a lot of, of young voters and newly registered voters who also don't have that experience voting. And so they need those people to come out to vote again. And so they are reaching out to them to give them reminders to help them vote. The the challenge in, you know, a runoff election, particularly one that's timed in early January, is there are a lot of distractions right now with the holiday season, and so people are very likely to forget. And so what I expect is that Democrats and Republicans are going to encourage people to vote whenever they can remember to do that. So whether that's dropping something off in the mail or whether that's going by an early voting location to do this while you're doing your holiday shopping errands, they're going to do everything they can to try to drive up turnout as high as they possibly can because that is the key to winning. Uh, Professor Gillespie, do we have a sense, if, if I'm a Georgian right now, what do I think this election is about? Uh, how much am I concerned that I, I either do or don't want the Democrats to control the Senate? Um, you know, so I think that, you know, this hinges a lot on party identification. I don't think that there's actually a lot of persuasion going on in this election. We see uh, character assassinations and recriminations going back and forth uh, between the Democratic and Republican candidates. Um, so that is certainly part of the narrative. And then the other part of the narrative is control of the Senate. Um, and so Democrats uh, should be highly motivated by the idea that uh, if they win these two seats, uh, the Democrats get control of the Senate and there's unified uh, party control control of the executive and the legislative branches, uh, Republicans have the incentive to want to stop that. Um, and so they are making that plea when they talk about saving the Senate. They are talking about saving the Senate from uh, complete Democratic control of uh, the two elected uh, branches of our federal government. 
Uh, Professor, a few years ago, it would have been remarkable that we were even having this discussion about Georgia and the possibility of two Senate seats going to Democrats. It was thought that it was a pretty firmly red state, Republican state. What has happened? Has the, has the state changed? Have the issues changed? What's changed? Um, well, you know, it's part demographics and part organization. And so what we've seen happen in the last 20 years is first, uh, the growth in the size of the African-American electorate. So blacks make up about 30 percent of registered voters in the state. Um, and this group votes overwhelmingly Democratic um, and are the base of the Democratic Party in the state. What we've seen happen in the last decade is uh, the growth in the Asian American and Hispanic populations. So even though they're still a small population, they're very fast growing. It's, it's doubled in terms of the size of the electorate. Um, in, in the last 10 years. These groups aren't as Democratic as blacks, but they vote majority Democratic. And then there is a, a uh, uh, proportionally speaking, in the white community, a small but a significant uh, portion of whites who are uh, liberal um, or Democratic in their orientation. It's a larger group than would be in some of our neighboring states. Um, and together, if you can get these people to turn out to vote, they could actually create a, a winning electoral coalition with the majority. So what Democrats have done in, in the, in, in the, for the better part of the last decade is to figure out a way to increase the number of likely Democratic uh, registered voters, and then they've made a point of going out and making sure that these people turn out to vote. So it's that infrastructure of mobilization that they've created uh, that is helping them to right. rival uh, right. Republicans. Thank you so much, Professor. Really great to have you with us. Andrea Gillespie of Emory University, where she's Associate Professor of Political Science. Coming up, we'll continue for a second hour on Bloomberg Radio with Balance of Power and talk some more about that vaccine. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.